And he goes, you did everything exactly as I would have done. And I said, oh, well, you know, thank you. And I didn't know at the time who he was, right? I'm like, okay, cool. You know, appreciate that, right? And then, uh, um, and then again, going back and, and, and hearing from somebody else said, do you know who that was? And I said, no. He says, well, that was the former weapons designer for the KGB. And I was like, okay, cool. Welcome back to Whiskey and Windage, the two-way podcast for the people by the people. I'm your host, Mike, joined by my co-hosts, Adam and Matt. Adam, how you doing tonight, bro? Man, I'm good. Busy, busy, busy with life, but uh, I can't complain. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Matt, what about you, bro? I am so freaking good. I'm just, like, I have ulterior motives on this show, like, that Ooh. maybe my own, my, my, you know, like, my, my own mission here, and I... I'm excited to... I'm not even sure what we're doing, so who's on the show? Dude, another freaking legend in the modernization of the AK platform. It's an AK show, isn't it? It's an AK show, yep. It's an AK show. Well, I mean, so RS Regulate is our guest, and they do lots of stuff for other platforms. Regulators? The regulators! We're going to have to... Oh, mount up, y'all. We're gonna have to mount up with for RS right, regulate. Well, on behalf of uh goons everywhere. All right, goon tape. All right, goon tape in the <laughs> yeah. fleck tarn. We're going in with the fleck tarn. I'm ready to be a goon. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm pretty excited, and uh, I think it's gonna be another great, uh, another great episode in Matt's giant evil plan of proof to everyone that World the AK domination. is has been modernized already and they're just maybe ignorant to what's out there and available. So real well, excited. Looks like, uh, looks like AK goon is loading in. Oh, let's freaking go, dude. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. All right, everyone. We want to give a big whiskey and windage. Welcome to Scott, the president over at RS regulate Scott. Welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thanks for having me on. No, we're, we're excited to have you on, brother. Yeah, this is going to be a fun one. I'm going to learn some more stuff. We're, we're teaching, we're, we're giving Mike an education today. So, uh, of course, it's on his favorite subject, modernizing the AK platform. Um, oh, God. Scott, I'm sure a lot of our listeners know exactly who you are. But if they are, you know, let's say they're more AR guys, they're not real familiar with AK market. They're not real familiar with uh, all of the options that really are available in bringing the AK platform to uh, to a modern standard. Tell tell everybody who you are, what it is that you guys do. Uh, yeah, you know, like I said, uh, Scott Hoskinson. Um, I'm the president of RS Products. We call it uh, RS Regulate because it's a funnier logo. Um, you know, I just regulate. I, I gotta, I got to take a step back though. So like, um, who, who I am and why the way I approach things philosophically, right. With guns, with everything else in life. Um, you know, not many people know this, but I was actually born in Switzerland and my mother is Spanish. My father is American and I've lived or worked all across the earth in various places. I'm, I've never worked or lived in Africa, Australia, or Antarctica. Other than that, been across the map. So for me, um, yeah, I chose a niche of AKs, kind of. I got some other stuff we can talk about too, but I chose that just because, you know, as, as a kid of the 80s, it was the evil empire, right? You got the East Germans with their AKs staring across the barbed wire. I remember that stuff. I'm not like crazy old, but I'm not a young chicken either. So I grew up in that world where there was definitely an evil empire and there was definitely the good guys and the bad guys. And that's why Star Wars made a lot of sense. Right, the bad guys and their conformity, and they were very East German and, and and Russian looking, and it all made sense to me. And then the wall comes down. I remember all that and going, "Wow, this is cool." Of course, I wasn't old enough or had enough money to buy all that stuff when it was stupid cheap. Right, when you could buy East German parts kits for fifty bucks, you know, magazines in the pouch, brand new and wrapper for twenty five bucks. That stuff was so cheap back in the day, and I didn't know anything about it. Um, but growing up, 
my mom and still to this day, my mother's very um, anti-gun. She doesn't like him at all. Um, she supports me as a person and my business and the, my employees and all that, but she, she doesn't like it. And that's because growing up in Spain, she was, and her family especially, were very prosecuted by Franco's regime. And they would literally position soldiers on the streets to spy on people. And they would pay people to turn their neighbors in, right? It was, it was really bad. And we, we don't know a lot about that history in the West because what we hear is, oh, Hitler, Guernica, got a painting out of it. The Spanish Civil War was brutal. It was ugly. It was long. It was brother against brother. And it was a modern conflict, right? Um, you know, Ernest Hemingway's books, it, it romanticizes that. But kind of the reason why I grew up the way I did was because my mother's influence and my father's influence. And my father um, you know, did his uh, voluntary service during Vietnam, did not go to Vietnam, but he did um, did do basic and it was assigned a unit and all that. They never deployed. But so I had this duality, right? Half, half, where half my family was supportive. The other half wasn't. So I never, I never had guns. I never grew up with guns. I just would see them. And I was a mechanically inclined engineer brain. I like that stuff. Yeah. You know, I want to know why it goes bang. I want to know why the thing you go flip here and does this. Right. And um, <laughs> I was in college and my roommate was like, dude, you like this stuff. Why don't you go buy a gun? Like, oh, I can go buy a gun. Like that's, that's okay. You know, he goes, yeah, you know, just go buy a gun. So I did. I went to the, um, I went to a Gunny's and if anybody knows where that place is in Orem, Utah. And I walked in and I with him and I bought the best looking Mosin on the rack. Right. Heck yeah. Uh, Do you remember you know, what it cost that? Mosins, right. What did it cost at that time? Um, I paid extra because not knowing what I was buying, I bought an XPU. So I was like, this one looks cool. It's in really good shape. And the guy goes, oh, well, that one's an extra $10. I think I paid 89 bucks or something. Oh, like my that. gosh. Um, uh, For an XPU? Yeah. yeah. And to this day, still got it. It's in the safe there. It is marvelously accurate. You know, it, you can it's, worth more, uh, it's worth more than $89. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is worth more than $89. I'm putting a restored scope on it or not, you know, but. It's the first gun I ever bought. And then I bought a Walther 22, which, you know, it's a Walther 22. It's fun. So that, whatever, but yeah, they are fun. That's the, yeah. that's the intro to, to, to Scott's 2A, huh? Is, is mostly in a family with no guns. And your first, uh, what started it all, the Mose and the Gun. The Mose and the Gun. Actually, what started it all, I remember my dad when I was probably, I must have been nine ish. My dad took like a two by 10 and he cut out a gun, right? And he gave it to me for Christmas. My mom was so mad at him. She made <laughs> me put it in my like bottom drawer in the dresser. Wouldn't let me take it out, you know? But looking back, what my dad had carved out of this two by 10 for me, and funny enough, he put a little copper tube scope on it. It was an AKM. It had the curved magazine. It had a pistol grip, a stock, you know, all that. So I look back in my memories and I go, you know, my dad gave me an AK. My first AK my dad gave me, he made it for me. That's really cool. You know? Which is pretty cool. You know, and again, my mom was just beside herself that I, I you know, dared give me a gun, teach me about guns. So um, <laughs> love my mother. She's a great, wonderful person. She just has this political aversion because historically, as we all know, guns have very much been used to oppress people. Her yeah. family specifically was used, you know, guns were used to oppress them. And so for me, 2A and all that, um, I do hunt. I don't do it a lot. To me, it's the it's the canary in the coal mine, right? It's the bellwether. Yep. It is literally our right as Americans to own guns sufficient to make our government listen to us. That's the purpose. It's not Bambi. It's right. not rabbit. It's stop, <laughs> retreat, Go do this the right way. That's the purpose, right? And so when I look at stuff, when I design things, when I look at guns, yes, there's a collector. There's a fun. That would be fun to shoot, take my kids out and shoot. But there's also a, this is the right of the person to have as much equipment as I can afford to buy, and no one can tell me no. Hmm. And so when I design items for AKs, for other guns, my philosophy is, 
this has to be something they can depend on. It has to be the most accurate, best thing I know how to make, and it better be worth their money or don't do it because that's they awesome. might end up needing it. That's, that's, it's that's not great. because it's Gucci. It's not because it's, you know, red anodized or what, you know, one of those things. It's if they need it, my, my stuff's got to hold up. So that's my oh, overall that's, Scott, philosophy. You're an yeah. I know that's so Scott, you're an engineer by trade, correct? Yep. So like getting out, you know, obviously you went to school, you're educated, you bought your first gun, you probably got bought some more than like you said, and you graduated, you're an engineer now. Was your first thought, hey, I want to build stuff for guns, or did it was that was that a slow progress? How how did it go from you becoming an engineer, getting out of school, and then building the company you've built now? Okay, oh, um interesting. Yeah. Um so what it kind of how it started is I had a couple of friends who were active duty at the time. Uh, I've never served, never pretended to serve. My, uh, you know, MOS is couch potato. Like, I don't do any of that stuff. Um, I'm right there with I, you, bro. Very support everybody that does. Again, I've got tons and tons and tons of friends, acquaintances, you know, family that are in and out of, of military and law enforcement and others. Um, they they pulled me into doing um, adversary training using airsoft. So we used to go be bad guys. And nice. that was a lot of fun. I'm like, hey, this is kind of cool. You could shoot your friends and you can go out and hang out and talk about it later, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So I did that for a few years. And then and then I was um, working as an engineer and I uh, I kind of ran a rapid prototype uh, facility at the, at the company I worked at. And I was allowed to print stuff on my own time if I wanted to, if I paid for the resin and all that fun stuff. And and a guy I knew said, hey, right. I'm trying to create this this widget can you design it for me? I'm like, Oh yeah, no problem. You know, you know, cause I, I don't really like you. I'll charge you X amount of dollars more than I would normally, you know, and then draw some parts up for them and send it out to them. And uh, a couple of friends of mine also do similar CAD work. So I asked them, Hey, what's a fair market value. Okay. You know, I'm going to charge them 25% more cause I don't really want to work on this stuff. And I did this for, you know, weeks and weeks for one person, then another person, then another person. I started realizing, Oh, there's, there's money to be had in, and doing this stuff and married to my now ex-wife at the time. She goes, you know, we don't need the money. Just go buy what you want. So I went and bought an AK cause I wanted an AK and I bought a really crappy, uh, one Oh five clone that is, and will always be my dream AK. And it was awful. Short, short cut there. <laughs> Terrible. Learn my Mike, when you're buying an AK, if you need, I'll give you some input. Cause don't buy crappy. Ones. Yeah. They're, Tell they're me what you care to buy. That's all yeah. I need to know is what not to buy. Um, but, and that's how I actually a lot of met some of the people in the industry was to fix that gun. Um, but this was circa <laughs> right, 2006, 2007, something like that. And, um, and then I did some more work and I, and I was like, oh, I want an ACOG, right? ACOG, or this is, you know, top of the line, right? At the time, right? I wanted an, an ACOG. So I, I found an SWFA coupon and they had some like, Hey, we found these in the back. They're so old. They're not in our computer system. I'll take it, you know, one of those things. So I bought an ACOG and I had an ACOG and I'm like, how's How this going to work? work? Right? And I'm like, I'm an engineer. I'll figure this out. Right. And, and it was through that journey of months and months of trying to figure out why I could put this, you know, I could design an ACOG mount, no problem. Right. Put the bolt here, slides onto this, blah, blah, blah. But, I would put it on my gun at my house, my kit build Bulgarian 105, fit perfect. I take it to my buddy's house who has um, a Romanian uh, SAR, uh, SAR 2, and it wouldn't line up. I'm like, what? What? Hold on a minute. So I'd make one to match his, and then it wouldn't fit on mine. And that's when I hmm. the light turned on. I, I literally have pictures of myself holding calipers up, right, going – and take a picture of the reading so I know that I'm not losing it, that I didn't write it down back then. <laughs> I'm not so crazy. Yeah. That's when I realized there's no TDP for an AK. No. They're all different. Now, there's some of them are close. Some of them are not close at all. And that started this giant black hole vortex of like, wait, what? And so I realized that, you know, and, and probably what we're most famous for is our scope mounts, right? You yes. have to have gross windage on an AK scope mount if you want it to fit. You cannot make a one-piece mount and get it directly over bore on every AK you put it on. 
it will not work because in my very limited measurements of, I don't know, a couple thousand AKs, <laughs> there's up to a quarter inch of windage distance between center of bore and the side rail plate. Wow. Is it an RPK wow. receiver? Is it an AK receiver? Is it a 74 style rail or an AKML original milled gun rail? They're all over the board. Is it Yugoslavian? Is it Russian? Is it Polish? Is it Chinese? Is it, I mean, you know, ad nauseum. Um, so that's where kind of the idea was born was I wanted to put my ACOG on my AK. I figured out you had to have gross windage and I built my first prototype. And I had a guy on, and I'm going to date myself here, the M4 carbine forums, who said, hey, could you make oh. me one for a 30 millimeter aim point? Probably. And he goes, because I'm a contractor and we live in Iraq, or sorry, Kuwait. We cross the border every day into, into Iraq. We go to our Conex, we open it up, I grab a gun, hopefully it's the same one as yesterday. And we, do, we go do our work, we come back, we drop our guns in the Conex, and then we drive across the border into Kuwait. We can't keep our guns with us the whole time. I need something I can take off and walk away, bring it back the next day, put it back on and have a hold zero. Cause he's like, if I leave my gun in that Conex with all this, this kit on it, next guy in is going to grab it and run, right? I'll never see it again. So I'll buy 50 ACOGs or 50 aim points in a month because they'll all be stolen. Right. So that's where the whole system came on that. It's quick detach, return to zero and Walk into the Connex, pull your gun out, grab the serial number you had yesterday, slide it yes. on, lock it in place, go to your job, come back, pull it off, no loss of zero. That's the whole philosophy behind my scope mounts because one dude on M4 Carbine was like, I'm a contractor and I need something that will save my life potentially. That's where it all started. Wow. That's, that's, that's cool. cool. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> and so ACOG, ACOG on what the, uh, you started on yours. And then, like you said, you started making them on buddies. You realized that everything is different as far as, um, the center line over bore. So when did, uh, it started with that guy doing contract work, but when did you think like, Hey, wait a minute, I got something here. Like maybe this can, maybe this can actually be a, a be something. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, again, the forums, right? Um, you know, you, the, the, the media and the, and the gun companies used to be really prevalent on the forums before the forums became so, yeah. I'll say, politicized in a good or bad way, right? When the moderators would, like, crush everyone who didn't pay them $1,000 a month to be there. Um, mm -hmm. I got, a, I got a, an instant message from David Fortier, if you know who that is. He's a very prolific gun writer. Um, he, uh, I listened to Mark Krebs' trip to Russia, right? David was with him there. Um, oh, David yes, embedded yeah. himself in the, in the, with the U S army during the invasion into Iraq. Like he's been all over and I consider him a good friend. Um, he sent me a message on, the, um, AR 15 one day I said, Hey, can I give you a call? I got some ideas. Cause I posted some pictures. Hey, I'm working on this. What do you guys think? You know, looking for crowd feedback and, you know, ended up talking to him on the phone. I remember driving to dinner in Madison, Wisconsin, driving down the freeway. Um, I wasn't driving, but somebody was driving. I was just listening to him talk on the phone. Because you mind if I, you know, talk about this? Let's talk here. Could you do this? What about that? And I said, you know, do you think there's a market for like maybe 50 of these? And he just starts laughing. He goes, if you don't sell 500 the day you announce it, uh, you know, you can, you can charge them all to me. And that was the day I was like, really? I could sell 500 of these? Wow. Really? You know, so that was, that was the day when I really realized what I was doing might actually be valuable to somebody else. That's Thank really you. Cool. That's really cool. I like, I like stories like that. I like starting, you know, starting from nothing basically as far as the business idea and turning something that, uh, because everyone will always tell you in business, you know, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Right. And when you, want to develop a product when you want to develop a product the first thing you need to do is identify your customer and you identified yourself as that customer putting that that ACOG mount on yours and it it grew and I, I love that I love that that's that's yeah, crazy and it just kind of snowballed from there right like um 
uh, another guy on the forum said, Hey, if you'll send me this, I'll run it through a class, you know, and I'm like, Oh, please, you know, see, please tell me, tell me what you think. Good, bad, ugly. You know, I've always been very open for that feedback. If I, if I send something out to somebody, I tell them, I'm not going to review what you talk about. I'm not going to ask you to change anything, but I want you to tell me first. Right. And so I can make any changes. If, if you found something that I didn't see, cause I 100% guarantee you, I don't have a lock on the best ideas. I just have the best ideas that I can come up with. Right. right. So you might have a 10 times better idea. I just never thought of it. So. Right. I like um, to say, never underestimate stupid people in groups. It's true, though. We'll, we'll figure, figure it out. We'll figure yeah. it out. Well, we figure yeah. that out even just is on as low end of a of a scale as our podcast. It's I'll come up yeah. with an idea and say, hey, this is it. And even if I think it's the best idea in the world, Adam will say, yeah, that's cool. But did you think about this? And I'm like, well, damn, no, never did. <laughs> and then we're high fiving. And then Matt's like, I mean, we can do that, I guess. But did you think about this? And we're like, never mind. That's the best thing ever. So. Those those ideas yep. they snowball and they and they they transform into something better. Yeah, that's exactly and, so, that, and that that's how this this all happened too. It just kept snowballing and and kept getting better and better. Sorry, go ahead, man. You're I was gonna say you're lucky though that you started it when you did because had you started this now and you went to forums, you'd been posting your stuff on Reddit oh. and you'd have said like, "Hey guys, what do you think?" And they'd have been like, "You would have got answers like." Oh, that's dog shit, but your mom's hot. Like, that's all you would have thought. And it's yeah. like, Reddit, Reddit's, Reddit's a bad place. Reddit's a horrible Reddit. place. <laughs> I, I, do, so I Scott, do believe I got lucky there. Um, and sorry to interrupt, but I, I do believe I got real lucky there with the people that reached out to me, the people that I knew from the forums back in the day. You know, some, some really big, um, kind hearted people who were willing to spend time with me as a new person in the industry clearly didn't know what I was doing. And, part, you know, impart their knowledge to me, impart, you know, their, their learnings, their understandings and the, you know, Hey, we tried that back in the day and that was dumb because of this, that, whatever. I did get real lucky in that. And, and a core group of people that I still consider friends to this day, you know, I can call them up and ask a favor and they'll answer it in two seconds. And they do, you know, and I'll do the same for them. Um, and all from the internet, you know, I mean, yeah, that, well, while, while Matt's got the question for you, I'm going to say you told us on your mount you have to have windage, and we can't have a podcast without whiskey. So now we got whiskey and windage. So, Matt, go ahead, brother. Heck yeah. So, I, um, Scott, you're obviously – RS Regulate is, especially as, a, as an AK guy, a guy who spends a lot of time in that community and trying different mounting options, like it's – you're going to be humble, but it, it's – undisputed that you make the best side mount that there is um and now and you're you're making um that's what you're most famous for but you're also making you're making handguards you're making galil stuff handguard conversions so how do you make sure that all of those accessories all of those uh new skews are living up to that that same reputation um, you know, again, I think it goes back to the philosophy that I, I want the core understanding here is that if my parts fail, the gun can't go down. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just a dude. I got, you know, three or four other people that help me manufacture the parts, QC the parts, put them in a box and ship them. We're a real small boutique company. We want to stay that way. Um, if my parts go down, the gun has to stay functional. And so when I look at parts like that and I go, okay, does it fit? Yes. Does it function? Yes. If it breaks, what happens? Right. Because, and I'll tell you, this is, this is a, a particularly bad problem for AKs versus say ARs or others where there's an enclosed system. Um, you know, I can design a, a, as a, as an example, I could take this side rail right here, the side rail mount, and I could probably pull another two ounces out of this if I really cared. But I also know that, you know, Jim Bob walking along with a backpack on trips and falls and tacos his gun under him, under his chest, right? That's a shock load of, you know, eight, 900 pounds instantaneously on the mount. What's going to happen, right? I mean, especially on an AK, that's a sheet metal receiver. So if I make my mount so strong that it never comes off that gun, what did he just do? He just bent his receiver, literally just took the gun down because he tripped and fell. That can't happen. Yeah. 
right? So like there's features built into my mount that were that are designed to cause the mount to fail if it gets to that point. So the, the, the mount will get ripped off the gun and the gun will stay functional. It's to that point That's where awesome. I don't want to hear a story of somebody getting shot and killed because my stuff didn't work. I'm very okay with them hearing, hey, I shot and killed that guy because your stuff worked. That's cool. But I don't want to ever hear, hey, I put this on and it caused that gun to fail. It went click instead of bang. Or when I hit bang, it went two yards to the left or two yards to the right and didn't do its job. So hmm. when I, I design that's... Part, that's why I design them that way. That's why it takes forever for me to put stuff out because I try real hard to make sure I've covered every angle every possible problem. And you know what? Sometimes I do get it right on the first try. And most of the time I don't. That's rad. I, we've talked to a couple of small companies that have a similar outlook of like, Hey, I want to make something that's fun. That's useful. But also they understand that the quality of thing that they're making could have a, a very real life, uh, life or death consequence. And uh, it's really cool that, you take that so seriously. Admirable. Yeah. And actually that's a, it's a fun story and I don't do this to toot my horn, but like um, I remember getting contacted back from, um, you know, 2012 ish. Um, got a ISAF guy who contacted me and said, Hey, I want, I want to, you know, buy, t you know, thousands of your, you know, an upgrade kit for all these AKs out here. And it just felt real odd. Um, opportunity to make buckets of money, right? I, I definitely would not be sitting in this house in this chair if I had to sign that contract. But, you know, I just, it just, it didn't seem quite right. And I just said, you know, kindly after we'd been going back and forth and talking product and pricing and all that with the guy, I finally just said, you know what, it's not going to be the deal for me. And it was about four to six weeks later, we started hearing all this, you know, green on blue. And I would have been heartbroken if it was stuff I sent over there that helped somebody kill more of our guys. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, and I'm glad I was like, you know what? Good. I, did, I sleep in my affordable bed real well at night as opposed to being <laughs> in a mansion going, Oh no, that was my stuff. Yeah. That's, that's, that's wild because with, with the AK two, it's uh, talking about, the AK it's, you know, it's more popular worldwide than, you know, the AR it's, it's used in more countries. It's owned in more countries. And so I understand the passion for them um, by the end users, but we always have this conversation about AKs and where the best AKs are made and all of those things. And Matt's pretty adamant that, you know, as far as modern AKs, not the old school ones, none of that, but AKs that are being produced today, he still he he believes firmly that the best AKs are being made in the US. What do you what do you think about that? Um, I think a lot of that goes back to um, what are the requirements, right? When when a company submits a bid for a government contract or submits a bid for whatever, or they're building up a, a part set for ellipses, right? I'm going to do a hundred guns for ellipses or whoever, right? What are the requirements? If you are a mass production company that's making 20,000 rifles for the military versus you are um, Jim Hodge making 200 guns for a specific, you know, three letter agency, which one's going to be a better gun? The Hodge, right? right? The small production. The requirements, right? The requirements. So are there guns made in the United States that are hands down better AKs than other guns made in other countries? Absolutely. Could that government that paid for 30,000 of those afford 30,000 of those? Never. No. Right? Yeah. So it's requirements, right? And, and so, like, I've got, you know, like you were talking about, it is an old school one, but Ooh, like. Goodies. Goodies, <laughs> right? This is the one that I built, like I was telling you. I built this down at the old um, St. Petersburg shop for definitive arms. It's literally a Polish 1969 AKM, well, PMKM, but whatever. Um, yeah. It is probably Gorgeous. the best built AK I own in a traditional stamp receiver configuration. Every single part was, was checked. 
every you know every surface was miked. Everything was hand fit and lapped. I was taught how to do most of that work. Um, most people have never heard of definitive arms. They build probably one of the most dependable AKs you ever going to put your hands on. Like it's a tool that's meant to save your life. Is it flashy? I mean, it's pretty, but no, it's not right. But at the same time, like you can get a, um, Mark, Mark Krebs builds phenomenal AKs. I own multiple Mark Krebs. Krebs. Right. Mark was one of the first people to ever contact me. Great dude. Love the guy to death. Mark's guns are amazing. You're going to pay for it. Right. Oh, yeah. You're not walking into your local gun store and buying a 799 AK that's worth your money. It's not. Mm-mm. Sorry, but it's just not. So, yes, fundamentally, I think the best built AKs in the world are built here because you have somebody who can take the time to put them together right. It's like an AR. I buy a rack grade Smith & Wesson. It's a fine gun. There's nothing wrong yep. with it. But it yep. is not in the same market as a hand-built Hodge or a hand-built Noveski or a hand-built pick your company, right? Yeah. It's, it's not yeah, that and I think it's, it, you can even go back to Krebs and you can even say, we all know he would decline it um, most likely, but if Krebs got a PO tomorrow for, you know, 50,000 rifles, he's, of course, he'd think long and hard about that, but he'd be, <laughs> uh, that's not my cup of tea. I'm not going to do that. And not putting words in his mouth or thinking like I'm Mark, but if you tried to take on that task, if your quality didn't slide a little bit, it's amazing. Just because of the amount you have to put out there, you're, you're going to have to cut some corners to meet a deadline. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just part of it. And and, I, and I've worked under those deadlines before I've had, you know, small contracts here and there um, with various people. And yeah, I mean, usually those contracts are unachievable timelines at price points that are usually not hugely favorable to, I got to hire a hundred people to make this work or, you know, whatever it's going to be. That's where it is hard as a smaller manufacturer is that I'll never be able to compete there. Right. If I get a contract like that, I got to give it to somebody else. Right. Yeah. right? I'm never going to be able to hire the, you know, 60 machinists and a warehouse full of machines to keep up. Just not going right. to happen. So I don't go after those contracts. There's no point for me. Right. Um, yeah. So Scott flip side of that. Uh, let's talk about mass production. And I think you know where I'm going to go with this. And what's your opinion? And like, you have a company like Palmetto State Armory that is making a lot of AKs in America. Um, they seem to be pretty good. But what is your opinion on the, the Palmetto's business model? And are they putting out a good quality product for the price that they're asking? You know, it, it, it's I know a lot of the people that are, I know the, the, the initial people who created PSA. I know some of the people in charge of their production line right now. And... Um, some of the people that work in their R and D department, you know, I'm not, you know, we don't, you know, go out and drink together, but you know, we're, you know, we know each other. Um, I want them to be successful. I want them to make the best AKs they can. I want every company to be like that. Right. Um, they kind of have come leaps and bounds from where they started. Amen. And I think you'll see that in their own product, right? They have gen one, gen two, gen three, gen four, gen five they can see the problems and they fix them, which is admirable. So as you continue to do that, again, the question is, what are the requirements? I'm sure PSA could build a better gun if they were allowed to charge two grand a piece. Yeah. But the market won't let them, right? Right. So they are building to a specific price point. And like most mass manufacturers of every commodity, cell phones, cars, whatever it may be, you produce a thousand of them, you're going to have a specific price and quantity. You produce 10,000, a million, whatever it is. They do a commendable job at the price points that the market lets them charge and at the volumes they have to produce. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So what I also appreciate, I went on your website today and I was, I was kind of like, by the way, kudos. I love your website. I love quality. I love when people put time into nice. like perfection and things. I'm a perfectionist. So I love the website, right. but, um, the modernization of the AK, that's kind of what my jam is. I do like AKs. I'm not, you know, I am an AR guy, but I'm not a traditional, like, Woodstock. If I'm going to have an AK, I want to modernize. I want to have a modern optic. I want a light. I want to. I want a modern rail for modern attachments. I want to have night vision capability on it. And that's kind of what I appreciate what you're doing. You're, you're enabling people that want that, because I know the purists are going to hate this, but, like, you're allowing them to take these rifles that they have had and, in essence, upgrade them 
to a modern style if they want to. And for me, someone like me, I appreciate that. I think how, like, as far as you designing products nowadays, do you get a lot of flack from those purists or do you not care about the, the AK purists? Um, I, I care, but not as much as you would maybe think. Like I, 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 I look at a need, what I perceive the need to be, and I go, oh, well, what would I do about that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, great example. Um, well, again, I, I got lots of show and tell because you're here in my home office, my safe's right over there. So like, <laughs> yes, I'll give you an example, right? Like, um, so Sam 7 SF. Um, oh, um, the drip. It's got the ribbed handguard cover, right? The ribbed upper uh, gas tube cover, whatever you want to call it. Um, I wanted to make handguards for him, right? And I could have just slapped together an ML handguard, but I, I wanted to do it that looked like it was made for it. So I, I spent the time and we did the matching ribbing on the handguard, right? Do you have to do that? No. It'd be much cheaper to not do that. It's quite expensive to do that. But I wanted this to look like it went with that, right? And so that's how... When I do those things, I like to a nod to the traditionalist and a nod to the future mm -hmm. person as well, who maybe wants to add M lock but don't want to radically change their gun, right? So, right. Um, things like this. That's how I kind of foot in both worlds, because that's kind of how I am. I like some of the old. I like some of the new. You know, on, um, you know, not all the work I do is AKs. Um, I've done some OEM work for other companies. It's kind of fun to do that too. Um, Again, show and tell here. Um, uh oh, this is a fun one, um, especially with my Spanish heritage, right? Set me L. Oh, so this is an LC. Um, love this gun, kind of fun. Heavy for a five five six, right? Real heavy. Uh, we worked with heavy Mark Marl, right? the Mlock handguard for it, right? So, um, as you can see here, oh. it's a drop in fit Mlock handguard for Set me L. Like, who else does that? So Mike's cool. been on an HK know. pattern kick lately. You know, well, I think I've you got, got him going. I've got, it, uh, I've got an HK. Basically, it's it's same thing. It's set and quarter, but it, I mean, it's an HK. Um, yeah. I am I am stuck on those things, but I took mine <laughs> apart and I can't figure out how to put it back together. So it's in a. <laughs> oh, did you, did you pull the, did you pull the lock lugs out? Probably you pulled the bolt I forward. Everything. Yeah. Yep. I made that <laughs> big old I, smile. He's like, "Yep, yep, you're gonna so, have trouble." So, so <laughs> what happened? Yes. Yeah, so what happened was I. Uh, I took this thing on a trade in and I got less than probably 200 bucks in the gun. And I was like, you know what? I've got one like it. I want to trick this one out. It's not mine. So now I'm taking it over. It is mine. I'm going to Cerakote the shit out of this and make it the coolest looking thing ever. Well, half a bottle of bourbon later as I'm sitting at my bench with pens and I'm literally beating everything out. I get it all done and I'm like, Cool. I'll go to bed. Woke up the next morning and I walk out and I was like, "What have I what done?" What the hell? I there, there is not a thing on that on that gun that has not been disassembled, unless it's grinding a weld. Like it's all gone. Yeah. I'm so screwed. I'm so screwed. <laughs> but I'm gonna do it. It's it's like my uh, it's my lifelong quest now. It might take me my whole life, but I'm gonna put it together. Yeah. <laughs> hey, parts kits for those are cheap right now. If you need some spares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. But, yes, you know, they I, are. I just, this is the kind of stuff I like doing, right? Like, I mean, I went down the street to the, um, I'm again, very lucky, blown deadline, Cerakote's just down the street for me and, um, you know, miss Mike every day. Oh, you know, yeah. had him stare with his handguard for me, right? And people go, well, it's not the same color as the rifle. Correct, because neither are the originals. Right. The originals are oh, slightly different right. green, right? So it matches the pistol grip, it doesn't match the rifle. That's so, so cool. nod to the old. Not to the new, right? Um, that's kind of what I just I enjoy doing best is just a little bit of everything. And um, frankly, it's just what am I into? And because it's yeah. my company, I can say, well, I want to make a handguard for seven years. Does it make business sense? I don't know. I don't really care. Yeah. Um, you know, it. I don't know that I made money on that deal, but it was fun. And that's kind of how I work through this stuff. I mean, um, you know, Matt, you talked about Galil Aces. I was there at the media event when Michael Kastner unveiled the U.S. market semi-auto ace. Mm. I ran over to him right after he was done talking to the media, and I said, can I, can I please take a look at this? I think I can make a handguard for this. I mean, it had been on the market for 12 minutes, you know, um, something like that, right? So, like, you know, talking about modernized Galil aces, modernized AKs, like, Adam, this should be right up your, you know, your alley. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. 
you know, 762 by 39 in this case. Um, this was the first 13 inch. It was a 16 inch and I cut it down. Um, super fun, right? Suppressor and this is, ready. Oh, you got that suppressor ready too, isn't it? Yes, it is. What, you know, you can what argue I, this is the highest quality factory made AK today. Yeah. Um, is the Galil Ace. These are phenomenal. They are out of the box, ready to go. Um, the first hunt I ever went on, um, I took a 308 Galil Ace. Um, on my first day, my first hunt, the first shot, cold bore, I dropped the bore at about 110 yards. Um, it had held zero through the plane, everything, right? Everybody goes, oh, it's mounted on the dust cover. Yes, but it's a little different on a Galil Ace. Um, and Beautiful, factory made, high quality, probably the Cadillac of AKs that you can buy on the market right now. Yeah. What and I'm looking I, at though, looking at the looking at your hand guards, looking at everything that you're making for these things, whether it be for that one, whether it be for the set me, whether it be for um any of them that you've shown, what I'm realizing, just like you said, is yeah, you know, with the ribbing on the first one, yeah, you didn't have to put it in there, but you wanted it to look like it belongs. And it reminds me of uh we had a chat with a guy many, many, many episodes ago. But what he said, a lot of the people in the industry do is, I guess to use the sports analogy, you know, all these companies take it to the 10 yard line and that's good enough. And thousand percent, yes. in some cases, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a thousand percent accurate. And that extra 10%, that's the hardest 10% to get. And looking at what you're doing, you're getting that 10%. Um, and so when you see things like that, and it does look like a stock handguard for that, I mean, I'm not an AK guy. Everyone knows that. If you would have said that was the handguard yeah. that came with them, I'd have believed it. Like, it looks like no, it. Tell Jeremy. Them. So he'll buy them for me, OEM. Okay, I will. We'll tell him. I'm going to. Uh, I'll just text him later and bug him again. But, yeah. No, <laughs> it's, it's, it, and it, it's also that, it's also that, um, you know, I don't get enough time at the range or training or anything that nobody does, right? If you could have it, you would. But, um, you know, just, again, this this Galil Ace, let me just grab this again and show you, like, yeah, that thing this is a very expensive reel to machine, right? It's got these pockets cut out right here, mm -hmm. right? They're out of a, it's basically, I mean, it says it starts an extrusion, but all of this is a very expensive machining to do. Well, why is it like that? It's because I shoot AKs a lot, and I know where they get freaking hot and where they don't. Yeah. And one of the places they get really hot and, and something that luckily on most ARs you don't have to, to deal with is this gas tube or, or piston guide, whatever you want to call it, gets really hot and it burns the crap out of your fingers. So I brought this up as a fence so you're not resting your hands on that gas tube. Big brain stuff. That Why? Because I shoot them. I know. It's not yeah. rocket science, but you, you see it's product that's put on the market. It's like, well, I took an extrusion from this other gun and I just, I made an AK handguard for it. And you're like, Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay, sure did. We cut yeah. holes in it. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I just, I, I, that's where like, um, I've had a lot of friends over the years say, why don't you make a, a handguard for an AR? And I go, well, why? There's people that know 10 times more than all, you know, that they've forgotten 10 times more than I know about that platform. And there's $10 handguards and a thousand dollar handguards. Why? Like, well, you're branding. I was like, yeah, but it's not better than anybody else's. Hmm. If I had a better idea, I'd do it. But otherwise, just go buy that, guys, or go buy that one because it's better than what I'm going to make. So do that. It's, that's the truth, yeah. too, because in the in the AR world, somebody will come out with something innovative every now and then. But for the most part, with the handrails, I mean, what are we going to do? We're going to do an M-lock rail. We're going to go with an old uh, key mod rail, or are we going to go with, you know, a quad rail? Um, now Arca, right? Arca's yeah, now Arca. Arca's, Arca. Arca's yeah. there. So you can, yeah, but it's, it's, it's just that thing where it's like, there's already everybody in their dog, but makes it feels it. like there's, it feels like there's a thousand hand guards already being made already. And it's like, unless you're going to come do something groundbreaking, right? Make it for, make it for another category of firearms that isn't getting the love that the AR gets and I mean, whether it be the How AK, many whether it be hand guards are out there on the market. And there, I, yeah, I'm saying. yeah. One. 
there's it's a good yeah, job in that. Aces, yeah. first one, and they all copied my design. Good job okay. finding that. Niche. I mean, that's okay. You were first. You were first. So my question is, you're doing amazing stuff. You you have some amazing products. What's the future hold for RS regulators? Any new products you can kind of hint at a little bit, or mm -hmm. talk about, or kind of what's the what's what's coming in the next 2025? Um, you know, we got a lot of stuff always cooking. Um, and again, the best part is it's mainly because I, I look at something and I go, Oh, I'm, I, I, I want to, <laughs> Almost. you know, so, <laughs> like, uh, um, some of I can talk about some, I can't, um, we took a of prototype of this to Kalash bash last year, um, which again, shout out to Tony and clay freaking love that place. Um, I know everybody else that goes loves it too. Um, so this is a Galil ACE gen two. We've been working on this handguard for a long time. This is the, the thinnest version of it that we're going to offer, um, 10 inch. Um, calm down, Matt. Um, you so, said 10 in, no, you said 10 inches. Matt got excited. Yeah. Um, again, uh, this is something we've been working hand in hand with help from IWI. Not like they're providing you know tech support or anything, but um, we sent them prototypes to to take a look at. Have their guys paw over them. Um, Again, this is a resin prototype. This is just a rapid prototype off our machines. But um, we do this kind of work because I want to check, you know, not necessarily fit, but fit to the person, right? When you grab the gun, does it feel right? Right? And one of our original prototypes had a had a much bigger top rail on it. Um, and and um, I forget his name. I think it was Adam also as one of the professional shooters. And he, uh, he came over and he goes, why, why did you do this? I went, um, cause that's where I put my thumb. And he goes, it's not where I put my thumb. Right. So he showed me, I'm like, show me, I'm going to take some video of you, you know, pointing the gun. How would you, how would you do it? How would you use it? And that's when I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to move it to over there because you're way better shooter than I am. And how I hold the gun isn't necessarily how you're going to hold it. So, um, that's why this has taken so long to come to market is we've been trying to perfect it because as you know, the, the, the gen two Galilee Ace comes with an MLOC handguard. So, why am I going to, or how am I going to convince someone to spend their hard earned money? And trust me, it's hard earned yeah. money, right? This is not free stuff. It's not cheap stuff. That they need to ditch the MLOC handguard they have to buy another MLOC handguard to put on their gun that they already paid a lot of money for. Right. And yeah. until I can say that this is demonstrably better, then I'm not going to put it in the marketplace. No, I believe it is. And we're going to try to put it out here soon, but. You know, I'm not putting it out there to take the money out of their pockets. I'm putting it out there because I think it's a better rail. Right. And that's right. kind of the, the, the gist of it is that, um, you know, I, I I think across the industry, and maybe you guys can verify this or not, but my sales year over year are down probably at least a third. And yeah. from what I hear from my distributors and other people in the industry, it's the same. It's Everybody's down a hard year. And it's very slow. I don't blame them, right? If you're going to the grocery store and you're like, can I get eggs and milk this week? Or do I want to buy a handguard this week? You're going to get eggs and milk, right? right? The economy is in the crapper. Um, our friends in Washington don't seem to care. So it's difficult to come out and say, hey, I've got a better widget. Don't feed your kids this week. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So we kind of held off on a lot of stuff. And frankly, it's not ready yet. And so that's one of them. Um, I know um, I was really excited to see Bobro was playing in the vintage Galil market as well. Again, something we brought out at Clash Bash. An OG. Yo. Um, nice. An OG drop in. Again, I don't like to cut stuff off guns. So, like people that, you know, hey, just chop this off and it'll fit. Mm, oh, thanks. No. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather not, you know. Um, so, this is a drop in, you know, handguard for an OG Galil. Um, again, who's asking for this? Nobody, me, you know, I like them, yeah. so I'm gonna make one. So Matt yeah. wants one. I don't even have an so, um, OG Galil, but I would buy that just so it was ready when I do get a Galil. That thing's rad. See? You know, and yeah. I played around with, again, elements of classic design versus, um, you know, modern design. And again, this is where we ended up with, again, the high fences, so you don't grab on the gas tube and a drop in fit. I'm big on drop in fit. Keep your cleaning, you know, cleaning rods. Keep your heat shields, right? None of this stuff is is perfect. Um, so let's not mess with that stuff. Um, so those are kind of some of the big ones. I got another, got a whole nother product line I'm not talking about yet, but right. uh, maybe maybe Q2, we'll be able to get that stuff out in the public. Again, it's pretty niche. 
but um, working with some friends in the industry, it's a gap that I think is a good place to go play. And um, luckily enough, it's a lot of guns that I don't already own. So I can go out and buy them and write them off. Oh, damn. I got to buy more guns. Damn it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, darn it all. I got to go buy another gun. Um, are business are they expenses? Are yes. Yes, they are. Darn I, it. I encourage right anyone who's into, who is into firearms, start a firearms-related business and start writing that stuff off. Yes. You know? You go to the yes. range, you buy ammo. Write it off. You know? It all. I have R and D, uh, you know, R and D, a Sam Seven SFK. Like you're, you're not going to get one of those. And just, <laughs> I am. Write it off, baby. Yeah. Like everybody should be doing that. Um, you know, and I buy guns for myself that I don't write off for the company. But um, by and large, the guns I buy are because I want to make parts for them, and so I right. have my company buy them, and, um, and and it's just a lot of fun. Um, you know, I mean, I want to take old and I want to mix it with new. I want to do stupid things like. Um, you know, I showed you that, uh, let's see here. So here's a, uh, a Draco. Oh, that's got, you know, red dot. It's got a handguard on it. That's awesome. And then it pretends like it's, it's Hungarian, right? So I'm getting hungry. what I do, I designed an M lock mount for pistol grips because why not? Right. So now it's the modern version of the old Romanian dong, but you can yeah. put it on your m and you can use another Romanian grip like the Hungarians did, right? So, um, again, just a, a put together because I wanted to have a handguard and I wanted to have a, a pistol grip on there. So I designed a mount to mount AK pistol grips to m -lock. That's right. That's the coolest drink <laughs> ever. That's cool as hell. <laughs> so, um, that is cool as hell. It's the modern version of this, right? Like... Um, here's a regular Draco. This is one of my bump in the night guns. This is a old echo nine, three chop down handguard, you know, and again, got the ACOG cause ACOG's PM90 folder. Um, yeah. PM 90 commando. Very AIM. Uh, on there. Yeah. Yep. Aimer. I've got an Aimer stock. I'm going to build up in a real Aimer here um, soon. Um, that's again the joy in this is, is it's esoteric, right? And I don't want to like. It's fun, and that's part of it, right? Buying guns is about having fun while you're getting tools, right? You go to Home Depot to buy a hammer. Yeah, you're gonna have a little bit of fun picking the blue one or the wood one or the titanium one or whatever. These are tools, but they're tools where you have some discretion of being able to buy something you want, maybe not necessarily something you have to have. And so, you know, I'm not choosing the color of deck screws. I'm picking what I want on my gun, right? It's right. still a tool, um, but it's a fun one. And yes, yeah. So, That's so you, so you talked about um, getting the call from the contractor uh, that kind of led you to uh, making more of your side mounts. Yep. You've talked about. Uh, a, you know, one of the cool things about being the owner is that if I want to build a part for a gun, I can do that. What's been the most rewarding to you? Um, other than, you know, the paycheck, what is the most rewarding part of starting RS regulate to you? Oh, good question. Um, I'm going to say twofold. One um, just an in interesting industry experience once I had at SHOT Show when um, I had an individual approach me at SHOT Show. I ended up having dinner with him and his wife. Um, he was a former um, weapons designer for, um, I think we'll just say um, the Russians um, for a specific group there. And he came up to me once and said, you know, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? And I gave him the reasons and why, you know, talk through this, this, this. And he goes, you did everything exactly as I would have done. And I said, oh, well, you know, thank you. And I didn't know at the time who he was, right? I'm like, okay, cool. You know, appreciate that, right? And then, uh, um, and then again, going back and, and, and hearing from somebody else said, do you know who that was? And I said, no. He says, well, that was the former weapons designer for the KGB. And I was like, oh. 
Okay, cool. So cool. Like rock on, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and to hear compliments from him, who was the lead designer for their small arms stuff was really pretty cool. And that made me feel good. And that leads me into the, um, the second part of this. And, and you say, what's the most rewarding? Um, I think everyone, I'm going to wax philosophical for a second here. Everyone on this earth wants to feel like they matter, mm. right? Well. That's everybody. That's why a lot of times people get married, right? It's why they have um, friends that they hang out with, and they do podcasts with, right? Um, you want everybody, if you make a podcast, you want everybody to listen to your podcast. Even if they don't like you, you want them to listen to your podcast, right? If you're doing weapons design or you're a cell phone sales guy or whatever you're doing in your life, you want you want to matter. And yeah, you, you can get engaged in the Reddit hate. I'm on Reddit, um, you know, absorb the, the heat, right? Um, but it's also good there too. Um, but the people you meet and the people you become friends with, customers, competitors, um, adjacent industries, et cetera, you start forming your own tribe. And that's when you realize you do matter, right? Mm -hmm. It's with your it's with your home, it's with your children, your spouse, your partner, or whoever you're dealing with your tribe locally is, but then you're taking that next step bigger. And so probably the most rewarding thing for me in this industry has been the people I've gotten to know and being able to say that they're part of my tribe or I'm part of their tribe, that's right? Cool. And I matter to them and they matter to me. Right. And so um, that's a big thing, especially today and nowadays when, when, when um, I'll say a lot of disaffected people are out there, you know, a lot of especially um, young men who've been taught for their most of their lives that they don't matter or that they're stupid or that they're, you know, you're, you know, you're bad because you're this, or you're bad because you're that grabbing a hold of those kids, showing them that they matter, that they can do good things. Not talking just boys, boys and girls, right. That, you know, your parents sure. love you, your friends love you. You can do great things. You know, it's that classic, um, you know, which one of those kids is going to cure cancer? Somebody will. Yeah. Right. Unless somebody beats it into their head that they're not worth it. And being in a business like this, you get plenty of people cross talking you, right? Hey, you know, that's dumb. Or why did you do that? Or, you know, that platform's stupid or what? That's fine. But the vast majority of people in the industry, as you all know, are good people and they mean mm -hmm. well. And they will help you. They will send you the shirt off their back. And I've had those experiences, right? Mark Krebs called me out of nowhere one day, said, hey, Looks like you've been talking to that dude on the forums. Can you take my call for a second? I said, yeah. He goes, stay away from him. He is not a good person. The first person who ever called me like that was Mark Krebs out of the blue. Since that day, Mark and I, right? Like he, he was going to make handguards when he started making handguards. I didn't make handguards for, I don't know, seven, eight years because I was respecting his space, right? I could have made handguards, trample all over him. He could trample all over me. You know, you meet the people. The people are the reason. Customers, competitors, yeah. people you meet on podcasts, right? That's why. That's the most rewarding single thing there. Brad. I love that. That's I mean, it's it's simple, but it's profound. Yeah. So Scott, you mentioned Shot Show. Are you gonna have a booth this year at Shot Show or are you just gonna be there? What's what's the game plan for RS Regulate? They want me to to exhibit so bad. Yeah, they always want to put me in like the back corner by the trash oh. can, you know. Oh. So um, oh, you, that's where that's where we go, would be though, if we trash can. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's been it's been a it's been a it's been a quite a while since I went to Shot Show, and frankly, uh, maybe it's the year to go back. I'm not really sure, but um, I haven't been to Shot Show in probably seven years, mm. and I've been busier than one legged man in a butt kicking contest, like. I don't know that I need to go and um, make my life worse <laughs> by <laughs> getting more business. But um, yeah, I love the people, right? And that's the thing. Like you could stop by somebody's booth and say hi that you haven't seen in six or eight months. Or um, people stop you in the middle of the, of the aisle and, and want to chat. Um, that part of it's phenomenal. I do miss that part quite a bit. Um, you know, as we all know, we're in one of the most regulated industries in the entire world. Um, it's very difficult to do business. Um, I've had multiple occasions at SHOT Show of meeting people who wanted to buy container loads of stuff that I make, container loads, and couldn't make a deal because I'm not allowed to, right? That gets so frustrating so fast that oftentimes going to those shows just bums you out, right? Um, you know, 
I, I, I think I got a lot of work to do to uh, grow the, the business that I got. Um, maybe with the uh, dealers and vendors that I've got. And frankly, I'm trying to be more accessible to customers. I want to do an NRA show or I want to do more face to face with customers. That's why um, Clash Bash is so beautiful for this industry. Yeah. Shows like that. There's a lot of them. Right. Clash to Con, um, Shot Show is so insular. It's for the industry, yeah. it's not for the customer. And I wish there'd be a little bit more spread in that. And I get it. You can't have a bajillion people in a Shot Show environment. But um, at the end of the day, if you go to Shot Show to sell to distributors, to sell to governments, things like that, you go to the other events to sell to people. Yeah, we just left uh, in August. We were at the uh, Gun Owners of America Goals event, and it was in Knoxville. And that was a that was a for the people. It was so cool. They did one day of just industry people, and then that was on Friday. And then Saturday and Sunday, it was for the people, yeah. and they showed up in droves and just walked around and talked. Uh, I was so I was I trying to get to that show. Um, I really wanted to be there to that one. Again, uh, life circumstances get a little bit out of control sure. sometimes, but um, you know, those are the shows I love. And those are the ones I like yeah. going to. And people say, oh, well, those are the shows where you got to talk to everybody and say the same thing 50,000 times. Yeah, that's okay. I'm here to sell. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll say this. We found some experiences. There are some great yeah. companies out there, but there was a couple of them that we walked in their booth area. We Mike counted to 60 seconds in his head and no one would come up and talk to us. Did but then three there's other times companies. in a row. Three, three times, times in a row. Yeah, we won't say their name, but there's other companies, like you said, they're great. You know, they're, they're saying it times we're, we're, we're keeping yeah. receipts. Well, Don't worry. <laughs> well, but the, but the fun part about shot to us is just what you said. Uh, being being in the, uh, the media space, we're fortunate enough to hear about all of the products, you know, offline before they're coming out. Hey, we're going to roll this out, but we can't talk about it or whatever. We're not going for the, for the, uh, there'll be a couple show stoppers that you're like, Oh, that was cool. I didn't know that was coming. But for the most part, it's to see the people and see how they're doing and meet the new people. And, and that's, that's kind of what it's for. Exactly. And, and it's, it's like you said, it's building and maintaining contacts, right? It's, it's friendships, it's relationships, relationships matter. Yeah. So we got a couple, we got a couple, uh, off the cuff, um, questions. It looks like we got three of them tonight. So I'll take the first one. Uh, Adam, you take the second and Matt, of course you take the third. Almost that time, um, baby. So my question, yeah. What is your favorite RS regulate product and why it's probably a softball? Um, great question. I'm, I'm going to softball you right back and say, um, probably, and this probably comes as a surprise, but, um, these little accessory mounts, I make them for, um, two fat shotguns all the way down to AKMs and others, you know, it's just a specific diameter of a barrel. Um, love the skull mounts, love the hand guards. In fact, really like the hand guards. That's actually really, really fun. Cause I get to play with a lot of different guns that way, but, um, this took longer than all of them to make. <laughs> and multiple prototypes over the course of more than a year of literal intensive testing on and off every single day, because you're adding an afterthought of a, of a mount to something where there shouldn't be a mount. And everybody will tell you, you, you can't clamp something to the barrel or you're gonna mess it up, right? Harmonics, point of impact, point of aim, all that fun stuff, right? And I can't say it's perfect, but it's pretty darn close. For adding something after the fact, this is the least amount of shift I've ever seen in a product that does what it does. And it's horrendously expensive to make. <laughs> I make literally less than $10 on every single one we sell, but it does what it's supposed to do and it does it really, really well. And I'll say that adding one of these to an AK in that, you know, in the position where I put them between the gas block and the hand guards. The gun is no less accurate than it was. It's still the shooter is the problem, right? So yeah. I love this for that specific reason. It's a drop in part. You can keep your cleaning rod. You can do all that stuff. And it really doesn't change. I'll say the mechanical accuracy of the gun is sufficiently bad, maybe, that you can't notice that it's there. <laughs> but it doesn't change <laughs> point of the game, um, for the vast majority of people. Have I heard that it does on some people's guns? Yes. But the vast majority of people can put that on their gun, torque it to spec, put a lighter laser on their gun, and they never know it's there. 
That's so that's cool. awesome. I love that. So took Scott, forever. how about this? Yeah, I, I bet. So Scott, if you could collaborate with uh, another company and or creator in the industry, who would it be and why? Um, can I give you two? Yeah, you most certainly can. Okay, uh, so the first one, and this is going to be a real oddball, and I think it's called, um, oh boy, I can't remember the name of their company. The company that makes the A545, the A762. You know, those uh, recoil balanced um, Russian guns that have the, the bottom, the, the fire control group is like an MP5 where it's a slotted in fire control group, and then it's got that recoil balancing top end. Um, very not a modern design, not a lightweight design, but it's probably the ultimate evolution in a Kalashnikov gas system gun. Um, really fun. I really want to have one of those. So if you're saying if I can collaborate with them and maybe get the ATF to approve a single import, yeah, I want it. <laughs> yes. Love it. Um, nice. Uh, so that, like that on the top of my, like top of my head, that gun, I don't remember again who makes it. It's like the, some of something machine works and they make, you know, tractors and something others too and handy tank rifles and missiles i don't know what they make but um i'm real sad about that situation with russia right where we can't as consumers and as buyers and sellers between the two countries we can't get fun things from each other because our politicians are acting like children hate Amen. that yeah um and you think of all the people over there that could have a better life if they were allowed to you know get cheap wheat Export. from somewhere right yeah all those people that poor people in Russia are suffering because their government's even worse than ours. I feel bad for them. Um, yeah, yeah. The second one I would say, and I don't think they make them anymore, but honestly, I think that the Daewoo was this beautiful okay. hybrid of a rifle. And if yeah. I could work with Daewoo to make a modern version of that gun with all of the stuff that we know today, all the modularity that we know today in the AR platform, that was a, a, a 416 before a 416. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of legs left there that could have been explored that were never explored. And I would love to you know, play a game with them. That'd be cool. That would be those cool. are really deep choices, I actually, bro. Yeah. I like them both. Though. Yeah, I actually, yeah, the, the day woo. I mean, I shot one of those in Korea. Actually, they're they're pretty cool. All right. Yeah. Wow. We finally come to the come to that point, Scott. And I, I, if you've watched some of our episodes, you've probably seen this part. So hopefully, you're prepared. But we want to know. NFA doesn't matter. Ammo doesn't matter. Embargo Embargoes doesn't don't matter. matter. <laughs> if you could have five guns and only five for the rest of your life, what are you taking? Uh, okay, so uh, again, I'm a little esoteric that way. Right? Like, I'm probably not going to give you the same answer that everybody else does. Please. But um, uh, again, the first one, I want one of them A545, A762, A it's whatever. You know, whichever one I can get my hand right. on. So that, that'd be a fun one. Right. Um, mm -hmm. um, I want a freaking cannon. Like, yes. loading, like, giant black powder. I don't care. It's I want it big. I, want it I need to tow it with a four-horse caisson or, you know, a truck or something like that. I want a cannon. A cannon that's, like, measured yeah. in tons. Just, They're yeah. like, this is a two-ton cannon. Like, oh, it's damn. I want a cannon, yeah. you know? That's Maybe right. a brass naval model. I don't care. I want a can. Hell yeah. Um, and that kicks and giggles, right? Like, I am not defending my basement with a can, but <laughs> maybe I could, right? You know, tally they stack like up on my door. door. Uh, fire for effect. It's fire, fire for, for effect. effect. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you, know, can, you can make a handguard for it and write it off. <laughs> there you go. A tactical yeah, carriage. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Hey, M lock carriage, right? M, um, M lock yeah. carriage. Hey, you can mount a light to it. You can mount a, an ACOG yeah. to it and call it <laughs> an ACOG on the sucker, right? Thread the muzzle and then it's suppressor ready. I mean, you know, whatever. Suppressor. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I want to a cannon suppressor. There, there you go. go. For, yeah, there you go. I love All it. All right, so the cannon. Uh, okay, so that's two. Um, uh, honestly, I, uh, I picked up one of my. Um, I didn't think it was going to be one of my dream guns this last year, but I picked one up on a whim and it turned out to be one of the coolest things I think I've ever bought. Um, do you remember those old, um, I think they're called PPC revolvers, the police precision competition or whatever they're called. Um, well, I, I was prepared if you asked me this question, so I did bring it out. Um, yes. These are all unloaded. Right? So the big PPC revolver, right? You remember oh, these things from back in the day? Damn. 
Oof. Who makes that? This is a Bill Davis. A Bill Davis. Um, this, this is a Bill Davis. Um, a, a Bill Davis Ruger Speed Six, which is actually a pretty rare gun. Um, I didn't know it, right? But um, the triggers on these are unworldly. And you can sit there in single action and just think, and it drops beautifully. You can double action wow. it, and it's not much worse. Heavy, yeah. Impractical, sure. It's thirty-eight. It's not three fifty-seven. I don't care. I want more of these. I want more. Um, of that. I want to. I want to. I want to rick this on the, my hip, right? I want to have the big, you know, stainless, you know, revolver on my hip and yell at my kid, Coral. So um, <laughs> that's my third gun. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, honestly, um, and people might be surprised by this. Um, yeah, I want some type of AK, AKM, Galil, Galil A, something like that. Um, are they the greatest gun in the world? No. Are they amazing? Yes. Will it do everything you need it to do if you take care of it? Absolutely. Um, probably in 760 by 39. That's not my favorite caliber, but it's probably what you're going to find. And honestly, I'm going to take a real lightweight uh, backpacking type, you know, sub six pound AR. Um, probably a 20 inch barrel. Um, I have one like that in my safe. Um, if I were ever in a situation where life as we know it is gone, that's probably the gun I'd, I'd take with me, right? I'd take a 38 revolver or a nine mil handgun and I would take that. Um, nice. you know, you put green tip through a 20 inch barrel, it's going through just about anything. Okay. Right? Um, but you can, but you can put any heavier, um, rounds in it and you can do damage that way too. And the fact is, you know, I'm Adam, you probably know this better than any of us do. If I have to hump that thing for the next 20 years of my life, I want that thing lightweight. I want it accurate. Yeah. Right. And I want to be able to exactly. bring enough ammo with me that I never need to worry about it. And you're not going to get that in a 762 AKM. You're not going to get that in a ACOG cannon. But um, <laughs> no. I, I would I would take one of those because, again, you're going to find ammo and parts for it for forever around here anyway. You know, in the U.S., you're going to find AR parts like popcorn basically yeah. so yeah yeah that's what i'd, where I'd be great at. choices all yeah. solid solid yeah. choices dude that's awesome the cannon is the best, <laughs> yeah the cannon is. is the best because that's because you have a long distance weapon because you forgot a long distance weapon well you, you have your ear 22 no. Bro, now you have a no it's, it's a shotgun it's, it's, it's a sniper rifle it's everything everything it does it all it does it all he also has uh, a crew serve he also yeah. has grape shot so it's a shotgun he can hunt bird he all, can hunt all elephant flock of ducks he, yeah like, well, that, he can take down like all somebody, somebody has a barret and they're like well it's anti-material rifle well, i have an anti-material cannon right you're like you know yeah i don't have to put a hole in the engine block i'm going to take the engine block with me right you take know it out. yeah so, exactly <laughs> he shall not pass i mean it's, exactly. it's done and honestly you guys like, again going back to that fun part who can who can honestly say they could stand next to a can and touch that thing off and not just start giggling? I mean, come oh, on. Yeah. It's the same thing. Like with the tank round when you're in, when you're, I've been in a uh, Abrams when they call, and it's just, it's, it's so cool. I have yeah. shot a can. Yeah, well, I like a little people. one. It was like 10 gauge, oh, okay. little, it like little, little scale model. It was fun though. Any, yeah. any ordinance that it is big and makes yeah. a loud boom is going to be fun. Like my favorite thing to watch uh, on Instagram or TikTok are the slow motion videos oh, yeah. of the guys shooting mortars and they'll drop it. And as it's falling, they're like giving you like, yeah. And then you see the ground shake and it goes, I'm That's like, Brad. that is just fun. I mean, they're who, cool. who wouldn't have fun doing that stuff? I, you know, and you could also do less than lethal. You could put a watermelon in a cannon. Um, feed people in idaho we make potato cannons <laughs> see yeah you know I, I remember as a kid they would they would cart one around at the fourth of july parade and you know they'd stuff weeds and rag in it and there's you know pow, you know like you knew that too but yes it's a win Dude, well scott awesome. i think awesome. we're uh we're about ready to wrap up before we get out of here though let uh let all the people let all the listeners know where they can find you on your socials your website go ahead and plug yourself yeah, and especially right now, um, we're running a sale right now through November 5th and maybe a couple of days afterwards. Um, talking with some friends of mine the other day, you know, it's like, well, no matter who wins, we're going to need it, right? We're going to need to get prepared. So I, I was I thinking in my head, channeling my youth, right? Zelda, right? And I'm, you know, it's dangerous to go alone. Here, take this, right? So I'm running oh, yeah. a, a Zelda sale 
um, on our website. So if you go to rsregulate.com um, and on socials, we're like rs underscore regulate or um, I got a backup rs regulated. Uh, but you can pretty much find us if you do a little Google search for RS Regulate. Um, if you do uh, Zelda 24 for 2024, you can get 24% uh, off any of the um, scope mounts we make. This is the I biggest sell so. we've ever put on. I, I, do, do. I don't do this. Um, it's worth the money or it's not. But right now, we've got to get this out to the people that need it. Um, we need them to be prepared, right, no matter what happens. And then, um, frankly, we're, we're putting all of our handguards on sale. Um, you use Zelda 45, they get 45% off handguards. What? Oh hell! Um, wow, sure. nice. Matt's um, about Matt's about to go grab the credit card. Yeah, we, Matt's uh, about to buy the handguard for the Galil that he doesn't why, own yet. Why am I always so poor? <laughs> That's <laughs> right here. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you guys first. Um, I'll tell you guys first. We haven't really talked about it publicly, but we're we're done making Gen One Galil handguards unless we get a big OEM order for a, or a military order somewhere. So um, we got them on the shelf. Let's let's get them to the people who okay. need them. Right, forty five percent off. Um, so Zelda 45 for handguards, it's on all of our handguards. And then um, Zelda uh, 24 for, uh, you know, um, all the skull mounts. And we're really just trying to trying to get to everybody before they freak out and uh, or don't freak out on uh, November 6th. So, Man, awesome. like hotcakes, man. Get them while they're hot. Get them. Yep. Hell yeah. Scott, man, it's been an honor to have you on. Yeah. We've learned a ton. I knew a little bit about the company, but you've definitely given us a lot of insight. You are welcome back. You are a friend of the show, and uh, we appreciate you. Well, yeah, thank I you guys. Wait. When I start building, when I start building, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be hitting you up and saying, "What do I not need?" <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lean on you because it's not more about what I need; it's more about tell me what not to buy. <laughs> well, and again, it's what are your requirements, right? What do you want this thing to be? What do you want it to be when it grows up? Because that'll tell you what you want to buy. Full auto. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, that's the only requirement. I don't even care if it has stock on it, if it has open sights. I don't care if it has a rail. I don't care about anything. Just a trigger, a magazine, and a barrel, and a pistol grip. And and a and a and a, and a full auto switch, and I'm happy. You so, want to ride? Huh? Yep. I don't even care if it's accurate at this point. It's an AK. Okay. I'm cool. You know, I'm, Accuracy I'm, through volume. Uh, what was that movie? What was that? Uh, Heartbreak Ridge, right when uh, the gunny uh, Clint Eastwood's up there. Bah, 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 this is the sound you're getting. The gun makes. You familiarize yourself with this, you know. It's like, yeah, all right, that's cool. That's all I need. That's all I need. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Scott, man, we appreciate it, and like they said, you're welcome back anytime. And uh, if you, hopefully, we do see you out at one of these shows, man. Maybe we can catch up and uh, grab a drink or something, hang out, and you know, just talk life. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. Big thank you to Scott from RS Regulate. I knew a little bit about the company, but I wasn't an expert in all their stuff. But after having him on and realizing like the quality of qual the, the, the product he's putting out is awesome. And not to mention Scott's just, he's a really nice guy. Like Matt, cool, what, what, what was your take? Um, I had a lot of fun. I am really glad that we did get to shine some light on things that weren't AK products. Cause I mean, it, it's kind of an AK show and, but he makes so much stuff. And for so many things that uh, that a lot of people might not think of or know that there's you know aftermarket parts available, I had a, I had a really great time. Scott Scott was awesome. Mike, what did you learn? Oh, I learned all the things. Um, it was so cool, honestly. I mean, as as the self proclaimed AK idiot, I mean, like I don't know that much, but I really enjoy talking to these guys, and I really enjoy hearing about it, and I'm learning all of the different things. Um, I like this guy better because he calls that front grip a foregrip, not a dong. Um, it's very nice. Uh, damned if I'm holding a dong. But um, anywho, uh, that's that's for Matt. But yeah, dude, I genuinely enjoy it. He's a great human being. That dude was a great person. I could sit down and just, you know, get me a drink, find a chair, and just sit and just chat for hours. Like, he was a good dude. Yeah, he's always welcome back. And then, by the way, if you are listening for the first time, make sure you remember hit that like notification bell, leave a comment. It goes a long way. We appreciate it. And then if you're uh, really froggy, jump over to Spotify and do the same thing. Just saying, guys. Yeah, frog. but, uh, froggy. But guys, if that's all we got, like I would say, stay dangerous, carry a weapon. We'll talk to you soon.